so the, the goal of this session is to essentially make sure that all the volunteers essentially are, are on the same playing field. That's why we sort of want to do the pretest and just sort of see where people were at. And then I'm going to do an introduction to cancer biology. And then I'll probably come back and do some more of these. I'll probably do one on cancer treatment. And I can talk about cancer prevention and whatever they want me to. So uh, I'll, I'll come back and do that. So I mean, currently, I'm teaching a cancer biology course in the undergrad right, uh, at the same time. That's why I couldn't help but give a test. I know uh, it's, it's part of my nature. So. All right. So, uh, when when people think of cancer, they they very oh and by the way, I'm recording this lecture and we'll have it up online, right? Uh, the PowerPoint, everything will be captured. All right. So hopefully that'll work. Um, but when when people think of cancer, they think of just cells gone wild, right? The the cells. You know, it's like the spring break girl, same thing, right? They just go nuts and everyone, you know, the, the cells are dividing and going crazy and out of control. And uh, so the question then becomes, how wild, right? Like what's really going on? And so uh, a one centimeter breast tumor, a centimeter is about a half an inch. And my wife was diagnosed in 1998 with breast cancer and her Cancer wasn't a perfect shape, of course, but at its biggest dimension, it was one centimeter, right? About a half an inch. There's two point whatever centimeters in an inch. So how long had that cancer been in there? And it turns out that cancer is much more complicated than people think, and that it takes years for a cancer to reach that size about three quarters of the lifespan of a tumor are the time it takes for it to go from something invisible to something that's actually big enough to find. The rest of that time is actually very short. Right? So we only see them once they've been around a long time. There's a lot of changes that occur uh, in that time. My wife is fine, by the way. I always forget to say that and people freak out. She's great. She retired. She's at home. She's happy. All right. Uh, but that, that tumor has been around a long time. If, if you do the math, right, if you sort of ask how long should it take, if we start with a single human cell, we're all made up of trillions, trillions and trillions of cells, like national debt levels of cells, okay? Uh, huge numbers of cells. If we start with just a single cell, uh, they can double every 24 hours. At that rate, it would only take around 25 days to get to be the size of a centimeter. And in another five days or six days, it would be the size of a basketball. Okay? But all of the evidence tells us that cancers take years. Right? So somewhere between three weeks and seven years or 10 years, is what's going on, right? That's how what you have to do to understand cancer, right? W what's involved. So that's what we're going to talk about. Okay. So what happens to, to to take a normal cell and make a cancer cell, and what controls them? That's what we're going to talk about. And in 2000, uh, there was an article published called "The Hallmarks of Cancer." The author's name is Robert Weinberg. Uh, if you want to see it, it's the one of the most referenced red cited papers in all of biology, right? It, it, certainly in cancer biology, it's got to be the top. And so the, the hallmarks that Robert Weinberg delineated for cancer are still in place. He actually wrote another paper 10 years later called Hallmarks, essentially the next generation. 10 years had gone by. And he wrote another article that essentially expounded more on, on this. But this is, we're going to, I only have a few slides. We're going to spend most of our time right here. Okay? Because if you understand the hallmarks of a cancer, you understand the hallmarks of all cancers. And, and that, that's what we're going to do. If you have any questions, please, please, please feel free to stop me right in the middle. Don't, don't wait. Right? Just raise your hand or make a face or something, and, and I'll, I'll call on you. Like that, for instance. Right? Hiding yourself. That counts. Right? All right. All right. 
What are the hallmarks of cancer? The analogy that I'm going to use for a lot of this is thinking of cancer like a wound that never heals. How many of you have been cut at some point? I'm looking for the invincible one. <laughs> She's never been injured, right? Stay near her, never injured in her whole life, right? Okay, so when you're cut, right, that's essentially our model. So just keep that in your mind. That's what we're going to talk about. Pe cancer has been described as a wound that never heals. Okay, the, the tricks of the trade, the things that cancer cells do, are not different from the things that normal cells do. They do them at the wrong time and for the wrong amount of time. Right? But it's essentially reaching into an old bag. It's not like they have all kinds of new things that cancer cells do. All right, so let's do the first one. Self-sufficiency, there's not a thousand of these, by the way. There's only like six, okay? The first hallmark, self-sufficiency in growth signals. That's a fancy way of saying it, but what does it mean? You're, you're gardening, if you're me, right? You're out in the yard, you're gardening. Your skin's job is to protect you, cover you up, right? Keep the outside outside, the inside inside. And you cut yourself, right? You hit a rock or something happens. With me, that always happens, right? So you get cut. So the cells that were making that covering, right? This is called your epithelium. Skin is epithelial cells. 80% of cancer happens to come from epithelial cells okay, of some type. So these cells were just sitting there. They weren't dividing. You cut yourself. The first thing that happens? Bleed. 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 Everyone says that. What really happens first? You curse, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, depending, right? Uh, yeah, sure. Some come out of a horrible exclamation. Oh, God, you know, what did I do to myself? All right. So, so you cut yourself, right? So you make an opening, right? The cells weren't dividing. After you bleed, what happens? You clot, right? If you have platelets, right? Everything's cool. You clot. Now, the platelets release a protein that goes out. Now, we have an opening in our shield, right? That the platelets produce a signal doesn't matter what it's called, right? A protein, it's a signal that goes to the other cells in the area. And it tells them, we have a gap, right? We have an opening here. You guys better divide, you better reproduce, because we need to fill in that gap, okay? Normal cells will not divide unless they're specifically instructed to do so, right? They must be told. To divide. In this case, the platelets release that protein that says you guys need to divide. Okay? Cancer cells divide when they're not supposed to. They divide on their own. It's not that they're completely independent. It's that they will either make their own signals or they break a system like a gas pedal. Instead of having to put your foot on it to go, it actually just like putting a brick on it. It's broken inside. Right? And we'll talk about that a little more. But they get their own, they, they become self-sufficient. They're no longer reliant on external signals to grow. Does that make sense to everyone? So that's what they do that's wrong. They become self-sufficient in growth signals. Now, let's go back to our wound. The cells are dividing. What happens? You get a scab, absolutely. You clot, you get a scab, and then the scab falls off, right? And what's underneath? Pure new skin. Pure new skin. Does it pile up? Does it keep dividing and dividing? No. no, you get a sheet, right? You replace the sheet. You fill in the opening in the sheet. Does everyone get that? Why do they stop? They stop because they bump into each other. Right? First of all, the clot's gone. The platelets are gone. The signal is gone. Right? So I'm no longer being told I should divide. The second thing is that these cells are reaching out and they hit other cells. It's exactly what it is. It's a physical thing. I'm not making that up. That's what they do. They touch each other. And if they're touching on all sides, they know that there's no place to go. Why would you divide? Right? You you have filled in that opening, right? You now have completed that. 
Job done. Right? Cancer cells will ignore that. Right? They ignore the signals that say stop dividing. Insensitivity to anti-growth. Right? And what they'll do is they'll pile up on each other. Right? That is one of the reasons that you get a tumor. A tumor means what? What does tumor mean? Does anyone know? Greek, Latin, swelling. Tumor, kolur, dolur, right? Those are the old, uh, the signs of inflammation, right? Tumor means swelling. And they pile up on each other, and that's how you start to get a mass, right? They, even though they should stop, they don't. Right? They're broken in that, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, is that the same yeah, it grows. It's it, but that yeah, but that's a benign condition, right? A benign, and I'll define that for you. But yeah, anytime they they start to pile up and you get growth when you're not supposed to, even a wart, mm -hmm. right, where the skin is is growing, and that often can be triggered by viral infection, right? HPV causes warts and stuff like that, right? But but yeah, anytime something piles up like that, right? Is the result always the same? Mm, no, 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 no. You have to do all all of these. And then you get it. Then you actually can get a mass. Yeah. Okay. So now we have, uh, and you look around the room, we have young people, we have old people uh, here. Um, we know that, that humans have a lifespan, right? And just like humans have a lifespan, it seems to be pre built into our cells. Our cells have. A limit, limited number of times that they can die. Okay. And it actually has a name for it. It's named after the guy that discovered it. If I discovered it, I would definitely name it after myself, but he did it first, right? It's called the Hayflick limit, right? Named after Leonard Hayflick, the guy who, who first saw it. And uh, it turns out that a, a cell will only divide about 50 times. That's it. You come in with a clock. Right? 50 times is how many times you get to divide, plus or minus, right? But 50 times. And so an example of that, just to, get to, to visualize it, if I took a Q-tip and I got cells out of a cheek of a baby, right? And I, and I put them into a dish and I let them grow, they're going to fill that dish just like skin, right? They're going to fill it up and we take them out, put them in, put a few in another, they're going to spread again. And if we count how many times did this cell divide before it essentially stops, the answer is going to be in the 40s, right? If you do an older person cheek, you're going to get less divisions. If you do someone in their 80s, you're, you're going to get very, right, only a few divisions, right? At that point, that's one of the reasons for aging, right, is that your ability to replenish your cells starts to diminish. Is everyone with me? Okay. Now, in cancer cells, they become immortal, right? Immortal. And so they have limitless replicative potential. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on the, bio the molecular biology of this, right? We can come back to it if we have time. If someone's interested, I'm happy to explain it to you, right? But it has to do with the replication, the copying of your genes, every time our genes get copied, they get a little bit shorter. Right? The chromosomes get a little bit shorter. And what cancer cells do is they turn on a process to re-extend them. So their, their, their chromosomes don't get short, so they can keep doing it. Okay. And you all are familiar with like the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks, yes, the book, uh, etc. And uh, she died in 1951, and her cells are still growing, right? There's much more of her than has ever was ever around when she was a person, right? Uh, her cells have been dividing very aggressively, actually. I would argue that they're not her anymore, right? They're not really her. Uh, but 
but these things just grow and grow and grow, right? With uh, essentially no limit. Okay, so now let's let's think what we've done, right? If we think of this as sort of the ga the the gas pedal and brakes and things like that, right? If if you think of it as a car, we've said now we can grow even when we're not being told to do so. We're kind of put the pedal to the metal, right? We can just go. We don't need. We don't. We, I don't care what you say. I, I'm gonna. I want to grow. We've said I'm not going to stop when I should, and I can grow forever. Does everyone see that? And this is a process that takes time, right? It's not something that happens right away. We'll talk about it. I'll show you a graph, right? Uh, that kind of puts it in perspective. But it, this, these steps take time, okay? The next thing is that our cells, normal cells, have a built-in system to detect abnormalities. Right? And the, the fancy term for the killing of the cell that occurs is apoptosis or apoptosis, depending on whether or not you're British. Okay? We like to say apoptosis here, right? Really, it's apoptosis is the, probably the, the better way of saying it. But you'll hear apoptosis. Apoptosis is programmed cell death. You've all seen apoptosis. How many of you have seen trees uh, and their leaves fall off in the fall? Anyone seen that? Yeah. Ever? <laughs> I was just checking you. OK, it was really about her. OK. so. Uh, that's apoptosis. That's programmed death, right? The leaves die, they're programmed, they all die at the same time and fall off. How about the uh, tadpole losing its tail? Right? Don't they have tails and then they take that tail in, it goes away and they get legs, right? That programmed death, it also happens in the webbing between our fingers and babies and everything else. That's, that's programmed death, that's apoptosis. And the normal response in a cell, if there is damage, if there is the DNA isn't working the way it should, if there are signals being sent that shouldn't be being sent, the cell will essentially take itself out for the greater good, right? Uh, we have trillions of cells. So let's say in your uh, brain, you know, you have 100 billion cells or whatever it is. 100 billion minus one is still a pretty big number. Right? And maybe you'll just make a new one. Right? So it's not like uh, that's a problem, right, to, 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 to take out cells. So the, the cancer cells, because they are abnormal, because they are sending signals all the time that shouldn't be there, right, because they're not stopping when they normally should be stopping, that should trigger this system. Right? That should trigger this system. And what happens is that the cancer cells become resistant, right? They're, and again, not something that we have time here to talk about. I'm happy to talk with you about it. Uh, it's a critical, critical thing because this is also what uh, leads to uh, drug resistance, right? Which we know is a huge problem in, in patients, right? But the cells don't die when they should, right? They, do, they, don't, they don't commit the cellular version of suicide, right? When they should do so. Right. Okay, so now we have this thing at the cell. Now we've made a cell that is essentially cancerous, right? This is a cancer cell, right? This thing is, is gonna divide, it's not gonna stop, it's not gonna die. This is what happens at the cellular level. If we wanna get bigger, which we don't, but if we did, right? If we wanna make a tumor, then we have to think beyond the single cell, right? We need to have a bunch of cells. Everyone agree, right? We have to start thinking at a bigger level, right? This is what happens on the per cell basis. But the next thing that has to happen for any tumor to get large enough to cause any problems for a person, we're talking bigger than a, the top of a pin, right? To become bigger than just a few millimeters teeny tiny, maybe smaller even, right? Very, very small size. They have to have what's called sustained angiogenesis. 
Genesis means what? Beginning. Angio. Angiogram. Angioplasty refers to blood vessels, veins, arteries, right? Circulatory system. Angiogenesis. They have to get a blood supply. Why? What does the blood supply do? Why do we need one of those? What is it? What is what does the blood supply give us? Oxygen is good. Right? What else? What else? Nutrients, right? What happens to those chips when you eat them, right? They get digested, it gets taken up. The nutrients, if there are any in the chips, <laughs> right? then go out into the circulatory system, right? To feed our cells need energy to do all the things they're doing, right? So we need a blood supply. Cells can only live if they're very, very close, right? To a blood supply. The oxygen and nutrients only float so far away and then it's too diluted, right? To keep you alive, right? So they have to develop a blood supply. And, and that's angiogenesis and sustained means that if you pull the blood supply away, the cells can die. And in fact, that is the mechanism of action of some of the cancer drugs, drugs like Avastin, right? And actually Sutent, Sunitinib, a lot of these other drugs uh, are designed to starve the cells by, by destroying the blood supply, right? So all cells need to have food, they need to have oxygen, and they need to be able to get rid of waste, which is what? What do we breathe out? Carbon dioxide, right? So we have to get rid of waste and we have to take in nutrients. The other thing that angiogenesis does, right, is provide essentially a highway system for these cancer cells to go to anywhere. Where is your circulatory system in your body? everywhere, right? So when you get a blood supply that invades a tumor, which is sort of what happens, right? They call them in, right? Feed me, Seymour, right? Okay? They call in the blood supply. Then now, unwittingly, unknowingly, not planned, right? Of course, the body has provided these cells an access route to leave. In addition to the circulatory system that we have, the blood system we have in our bodies, what other system do you have that goes everywhere? Nerves, Nerves absolutely. There is, or there's another circulatory system, the lymphatic system, right? Lymphatic system. So what is the lymphatic system? People hear of lymph nodes, but they really don't know what the lymphatic system is, right? So it's every bit as pervasive as the circulatory system. If I were standing here and I were evaporated, you know, some new military weapon, right? If I was obliterated except for my lymphatic system, you would still be able to see everything, right? You would know exactly where I was, right? It's, it's very extensive. It, it's everywhere. And what happens is you all know that you have blood pressure, all right, well, that pressure in your, blood vein, in your blood vessels pushes fluid out of the, of the vessels. And that fluid then gets absorbed back into the lymphatic system. And then it gets collected. It goes through lymph nodes. You certainly have all heard of lymph nodes, which are grape-like clusters of, in the lymphatic system. It drains, you of course know this better than I, many of you, that you have lymphatics under your arms, in your pelvis, etc., right? Behind, in your neck. Those lymphatics then, that fluid gets dumped back into the circulatory system right under your clavicle, right? They join back together and it puts it back in and everything starts over. The lymphatic system also is full of a lot of lymphocytes. Site just means cell. Lymph means they live in there. Lymphocytes, good name for them. Right? And those are immune cells. Okay. All right. And can cancer move through the lymphatic system? I think you'll be able to answer this one. Yes. <laughs> All right. So it can go either way. Right? Cancer can get into the, to the blood system and move around, or it can invade and move through the lymphatic system. Okay. Number six, tissue invasion and metastasis. Okay. Technically, it's not cancer. It's not malignant, and I have this up on a later slide. I don't know if we'll get, we'll get to everything. It's not cancer unless it invades, unless it spreads, right? So ductal carcinoma in situ, the breast cancer, 
right? People say they have breast cancer. That's not technically cancer. Right? It hasn't invaded. It has a very high likelihood of invading, and so people have it removed because you don't want it to spread. But it's not technically. Technically, when something starts to punch through the, the area in which it first arose and starts to spread, that is when something becomes cancer. So tissue invasion and metastasis. When you're healing, we we'll go back to our wound, right? When you're healing, you had an empty space, right? First, you have to lay down some proteins for the cells to crawl on. They walk. Don't they have to move and spread? Right? They have to, right? Otherwise, how do you get from the edge to the middle, right? They have to move. And so cells can do that, right? That's a normal thing for cells to be able to move around and crawl uh, over sort of this mesh that's in between that holds us together. So that's a normal thing. But with cancer, of course, this, this tissue, what they call the fancy term is remodeling. Not the kind of remodeling that we like, right? But uh, the, they're breaking down and rearranging things constantly, and they're able to crawl. Uh, metastasis is really the, the major killer, right? Metastasis is the source of 90% of the deaths that are associated with cancer. Right? You all are familiar with the difference between morbidity and mortality? Morbidity is sickness. Mortality is death, right? So the mortality associated with cancer, 90%, 9 out of 10 cancer deaths are caused by metastatic growth, right? Uh, there are cancers which can be lethal in their original location. Brain cancer, a great example, right? There's not much room up there, pretty important organ for most people, right? And uh, so obviously uh, you have to, you know, it, it can cause major problems without going anywhere, right? Uh, but for breast cancer, which is so common, I mean, this is one that, that we're all very familiar with, millions of survivors of breast cancer just in the U.S. alone, right? Breast cancer, what happens if you take your breast off? If you're a healthy woman, you have your breast removed, do you die? Do you need your breast to live? Absolutely not, right? It's a blob of fat. Highly glamorized, but a blob of fat nonetheless, right? And so it's a blob of fat. The function of the breast is to deliver milk, right, to a baby should you have one. That's what breasts are for, right? They're not vital to life. So breast cancer in itself, in its original location, will not kill you. Right? The problem comes when it moves. Okay? So metastasis, understanding it, preventing it, detecting it, etc., is critical, right? Uh, and it's actually one of the hardest things uh, to tackle. But that's a critical thing, right? Metastasis. Uh, just to uh, a couple more things about this. One, the process, the movement of the cells from point A to point B is called metastasis with an I, right? I just want you to, I'll be a little technical here. That's metastasis. When you get the growth in that location, right? Now we're looking in point B now. That's called a metastasis with an E. Cis is the process. It's metastatic. It's metastasis. It's metastasizing. Right? Metastases are the physical things you can hold. Cis is the process. You can't hold it. Right? Metastases are the growth. Just so you know. Right? Just so you guys all understand. Of course, what do we really call them in the clinic? Mets. They just call them Mets, right? That's what people say. Mets. Okay. All right. Now, one more question. You have, uh, and this was off, off, of, off of your thing here, right? Uh, what we did. It, it, have you ever seen the movie Dodgeball? Yes. Anyone seen that? It's very funny. If you didn't see it, you should. It's silly and very funny. I love it, right? 
So, uh, but in that movie, Lance Armstrong is in there. This was pre-disgraced Lance, right? This was when people liked him, right? So, so Lance Armstrong is in there, and in that in the movie, he meets the guy in the bar, right? Who's very discouraged. I don't want to give it away, but the guy's discouraged. Lance meets him in the bar, and he says, "Oh, you know, like, sure, give up. Like, look at me. I had brain cancer, lung cancer, you know, testicular cancer, all that. Is that true?" No, what did he have? Testicular. He had testicular cancer, right? And it doesn't matter if it goes to your lung, your brain, your kidney. It is still testicular, testicular cancer. And that is, for, for you people, very important, right? Because you're going to have lots and lots of patients that confuse that, right? Many, many, many people think that if you have breast cancer and it goes to your lungs, you now have lung cancer. You don't. It was a breast cell. It left the breast. It still, though, acts like a breast cell, right? And it's still treated with the drugs that are used to treat breast cancer. It's in a new location. It's a metastatic. The first cancer, of course, is called the primary site, and then you have secondary and you know the metastatic sites, right? But that's something that you will run into, and people get very confused. Yeah. Absolutely. Happens all the time. Happens all my father in law had colon cancer and now he is being treated for for uh, leukemia here. Uh, it's not and in fact the treatment for the first one can cause the second one. Right? That's a side effect of chemo is cancer. Right? Um, so so it, it's very common and and what they would say is it's a second primary cancer. They're unrelated, right? I mean, the only way that you're going to see the re they're related is whether if this person has some kind of underlying genetic, you know, thing, right, that makes them more likely to get all different kinds of things, right? Or, or environmental, they smoke, or, or something else, right? That, that's causing that. Okay. All right. And underlying all of these changes, which take years, right, which take a long time to happen, is some form of genetic instability. All cancer cells are genetically unstable. They change all the time. They evolve, right? So uh, if you don't believe in evolution, uh, uh, a cancer will teach us otherwise, right? Because if you treat someone with uh, drug A uh, for so many years and then they become resistant to that, that cancer has evolved. Right? It no longer responds to that drug. Okay, so uh, they they're genetically unstable. Okay, so the the genetic changes, and I'm not going to dwell on this uh, for for very long at all. They can be very small changes. Uh, if you've uh, are familiar with with DNA, right, which you memorized, right? Who memorized that? Someone. Yeah. The spelling. Okay, right. So so this is so so here we have right. Here we have our, our deoxyribonucleic acid, right, DNA, and it has four letters in it. Uh, in a human genome, there are about six billion altogether, a lot of letters, right? Uh, we have 23 chromosomes, two pair, right? So we have 46. Yes, everyone know these things? No? Right? We have 46 chromosomes. We got 23 from mom, 23 from dad, right? Sperm has 23, egg has 23, right? So 46. Uh, and uh, we have billions of these letters. And so you can get a very small change, something that would change, for instance, the word cat to the word tat. That is enough to trigger uncontrolled growth or give you growth sufficiency, right? Self sufficiency. So have you heard of the RAS oncogene, any of you? Anyone? Right? So it's common, about 40% of cancers have mutations in that, and it's a single letter difference between the normal one and the one that causes problems. Okay? So you can have very small changes. You can have big changes uh, in which chromosomes, these are our models uh, of a diagram of a chromosome, and they actually swap pieces. Right? So uh, the one that you, that you may be familiar with is in CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia. Have you ever heard of that, CML? Right? So in that cancer, there is a very particular swap of information 
between chromosomes 9 and 22. And when they do that, at the junction, right here, right, right at this junction, you actually join two parts of this information together. And that new information is what encodes the problem-making thing. Right? So, but the bottom line is you can have small little changes, big changes, uh, and then sometimes the changes we're now learning more and more about this is that the changes can be very subtle, right? Uh, and these are called epigenetic changes. That's very technical, and you can forget that immediately. But epigenetic changes, they're very, very common. Now, now as we're learning, like, for instance, if your mother smokes, that their grand, your grandkids can have problems. Right? If you smoke, it's your grandkids and great-grandkids because of epigenetic. Epi means above, and epigenetic means above the genome. And so there are very small changes, and the analogy that would work pretty well would be like this. You take the word cat, and it, you don't change the letter. It's still a C, but it, it's a little different looking. And that information is interpreted differently. All right? So very, very subtle changes teeny tiny little changes, right, can, can cause it. So what are we changing? Well, what, I'm sorry, what causes these changes, right? So cigarettes, tobacco, we know that, right? Tobacco certainly is the major uh, 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 mutagen, right? That's our tobacco alarm. <laughs> no problem. I hate it too. I always have alarms go off when I'm, you know, the T word, yeah. Right. So, cigarettes, right? Chewing tobacco, any of those, right? Huge, huge problems. The tobacco smoke contains chemicals which alter those letters, right? And we know that all you got to do is make a teeny change in the wrong place, in the wrong thing, right, to cause a problem. Uh, you can have environmental chemicals like asbestos, right? You're all probably familiar that asbestos is associated with mesothelioma, right? Um, and, and the actor, who was he that went in the, used to drive in the desert all the time? Was that Newman? Or it was, yeah. it, not Newman, it was one of them. Oh, Steve McQueen. Yeah. Steve McQueen, right? And he used to go in the desert all the time. And where he rode, there was a lot of asbestos that was being thrown up in the air and he breathed it in. And, and it, 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 causes, it causes cancer. Radiation uh, from the sun, uh, major risk factor for skin cancer, including melanoma, right? The one that, that causes the most problems. Tanning beds are now classified as a carcinogen, right? Class one, uh, horrible uh, thing to do. Medical exposure is thought to probably increase your risk. So people that are, have repeated CAT scans, x-rays, and things like that, that it's all cumul it's cumulative, right? So uh, you don't want to have it unless you, you really need it. Um, mistakes by the cell, that is, caca happens, right? Uh, 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 mutations just happen, right? Spontaneous mutations. Um, they're very common, more common than you'd think. I mean, thousands and thousands per cell, per division. But most of them are fixed, right? We have uh, built-in checking. Uh, most of them are fixed, but it's, it's very common. And then there are viruses uh, that are associated with uh, cancer. So one of them is hepatitis, right? Hepatitis B, hepatitis C, long-term infection. The thinking is that most cancers, one of the commonalities of cancer is inflammation. You familiar with that? Right? So inflammation underlies most, if not all, right, uh, cancers. And so when someone has hepatitis, it's not hepatitis for a week that's an issue. It's having hepatitis for 20 years that's an issue. Right? And so the cells are infected. They're dying. Your immune system is trying to fix that. And the way it tries to do that is by producing lots of toxic chemicals to try to get rid of the virus. You have cells that are dividing rapidly, right, making copies of their DNA very rapidly in the presence of chemicals that can cause mutations, changes in the DNA. That's a recipe for disaster. Do you see that? Right? So what other inflammatory diseases, for instance, are associated? Colitis, Crohn's disease, right? 
Huh? Arthritis I've not seen because arthritis is in the bone and the bone isn't, it doesn't really, I mean, isn't dividing the same. Um, but like, that's a good thing and, and I wouldn't be surprised. Even prostate cancer, obesity actually, just being heavy increases amounts of chemicals that are associated with inflammation. So it doesn't have to be a major inflammation. You th people think inflammation, they think red, pus, you know. It doesn't have to be that, that overt, right? It doesn't have to be that severe, okay? That's the human papillomavirus, right? So HPV works in a different way. So HPV causes probably all, very close to all, of cervical cancers. It causes uh, at least 90% of anal cancers and an increasingly, right? I mean, this is an epidemic. I mean, the, the, the word is, is epidemic of throat, uh, mouth, oral cancers, right? All of them sexually transmitted, right? Oral sex, anal sex, vaginal sex, right? All of those things happen. All of those things can, can transmit the virus. And uh, HPV, again, 80% of American women will be infected with HPV in their lifetime. 80%. Okay. But almost all of those people will clear the virus within two years, right? Their body gets rid of it and it's just gone. Okay. It's the people that keep it for a long time that have a problem. And the virus, again, without getting into the molecular side of things, the HPV, when it comes into a cell, it wants to take over because it wants to make copies, right? And the cell wants to stop that. And so the virus brings in some proteins, some weapons, right, to neutralize the cell. And it's those proteins, when they're expressed for a long time, that cause problems. Does that make sense? Right? So you've all had infections. You get a cold, right? You get an infection. It does its thing, and it leaves. It's, it's this long-term stuff that's a problem. Right? Okay. So what are we changing, right? If we're talking about all these mutations and radiation and smoking and all this stuff, what is changing? And broadly speaking, there are two major categories of targets, okay? The human genome, all those six billion letters, right? All together encode about 20,000 genes. And a gene is something that just is a functional unit. Just think of it like a bead, you know, in a thing, right? That's a functional unit. You've got about 20,000 of those. And these two kinds of genes are the subset of that 20,000 that seem to be most important in cancer. This is what changes when we have uh, a cancer. So there are tumor suppressors, and their normal function is not anything to do with tumors. Right? That's not a normal process, right? That is, they're, they're known as tumor suppressors because their normal activity is to essentially act as cellular breaks, right? Their, their job is to stop cells from this endless division, right? They're the break system of the cells. They regulate cell growth and division. They're involved in DNA repair. So, for instance, the DNA repair tumor suppressor that you're familiar with is BRCA. Right? The BRCA genes, BRCA1, BRCA2, their job is in DNA repair. And when they're broken, then uh, problems can ensue. Right? They're also responsible for this apoptosis, this cell death thing. So again, you could see that if you break one of those, that is, you destroy something that's supposed to be causing this death, that now the cell, the cancer cell, has an advantage. Right? So tumor suppressors, their job is negatively regulating cells, right? They're killing them, they're, they're saying, whoa, okay, they're the break system. The oncogenes, or better named, really, the true name for the non-defective form, the real form, the functional form, they're called proto-oncogenes, okay? But these genes, call them what you want, these oncogenes, their function in normal cells is the same as it is in cancer cells, which is to stimulate cell division. Right? They act as a cellular gas pedal. 
they do exactly the opposite. They enhance survival. They are the genes that are facilitating, enabling angiogenesis and invasion. And the ones that you are probably familiar with, or, or most likely, I would say, familiar with, are HER2, right, which is this antenna that's on breast cells that receives growth signals. The epidermal growth factor receptor, which is a target of multiple drugs. This is something that people that work in lung cancer deal with all the time. And the ABL kinase, which is the one that gets broken in that translocation that we looked at, right? That, that chromosome swap in CML. Right. So, uh, again, bottom line, the names, I think, are probably not so important for you to know, but tumor suppressors, brake system, oncogenes, gas pedal. Right. So, I said that really small changes can make a difference. If you change a single letter in the RAS proto-oncogene, it goes from a gene that's on and off when it's supposed to be to a gene that's on, sending signals all the time. Did everybody get that? Are there questions on any of that? Right? Okay. Okay. So, why does cancer take seven years to get to be a, a problem, right? Or ten years, or whatever it is, depending on the cancer type. Uh, what is the biggest risk factor for cancer? Getting old, right? Like everything else, right? It's a problem, right? So, so getting old is, is age is the single greatest risk factor, right? Uh, yeah. When children get it, is that because has there been any knowledge to say that the parents maybe had some gene issues I'm, at the time of conception? It, it's it can be inherited. We can talk about. We'll talk about that actually. Uh, we'll see how much time we have. But but uh, sometimes. Uh, you can inherit, a def just like BRCA, you can inherit a defective copy, right, from your parents and, and get cancer. Sometimes there will be a developmental problem, like a switch doesn't get turned off, you know, right? They're growing very quickly, right, from one cell to a baby in nine months. So, so you have very rapid division, and if one of those cells uh, misbehaves, then it can be passed on, and the baby will be born, but that cell's in there, and it will, it will grow. Well, I mean, like I said, sometimes we can look at it, we can look at the family, and we can say, this gene is broken in the mother, this gene is broken in the grandmother, and we can trace it up. Sometimes it comes under the, it just happens. Yeah. It depends on the cancer. Everyone is different. Yeah. But there is good evidence. I mean, to answer your question, yes, there's very good evidence for inherited cancers, but just some of them, right? Okay, so the, the studies on big populations show that it takes around five or six genetic changes. So we got to take, of those 20,000 genes that we have, we have to break the gap, the, we have to put the pedal to the metal, right? We have to turn on some of those oncogenes, and we have to kill the brakes, and we have to stop cell death, right? And we have to live forever, right? We got to do all those things. And that takes around five or six changes. So this is colon cancer rates per 100,000 versus age. Right? And it's, it's the slope of these kind of curves, when people look at different cancers, that essentially are used to say how many changes have to happen. Right? Okay. So inherited cancers. Right? What, what's the deal with inherited cancers, right? Do we inherit cancers? So uh, one example is the BRCA gene, right? Because we all know uh, that, that people, women, uh, in general women, I don't, very rarely men, right, can be tested uh, for mutations in BRCA. BRCA stands for what? Brr. Brr. Breast. Good. Ka. Cancer. Good. Breast cancer. So... <laughs> So this is the breast cancer gene, okay? Right? This is the breast cancer gene. BRCA, the first one they called, the first one they found they named BRCA1. One. One. And the second one they called 
two. Go, you guys are all over this genetic stuff. All right. So, yeah, so, so BRCA, right, is a breast cancer gene. Its job is, is being a tumor suppressor. Its job is fixing mutations, right? So it doesn't make mutations. Losing BRCA doesn't make the mutations more likely to happen. But if they do happen, you're not able to fix it. Okay? So you don't inherit a cancer with BRCA. You inherit an increased likelihood that you'll get cancer because you can't fix things the way other people can. Does everyone get that? All right. So the, inc the, the cancer risk is much higher. RB is a tumor suppressor. In fact, it was one of the very first tumor suppressors ever discovered. It stands for retinoblastoma, right, which is an eye cancer. And as you, you, you may or may not know, right, uh, m many cases of retinoblastoma occur in very young children. Okay? So there are two ways of getting retinoblastoma. One is the inherited or familial form. It goes down through families, which we would definitely be able to trace, right? The other is sporadic, or it just happens, okay? In order to get retinoblastoma, you have to have both copies, right? You have one from mom, one from dad. Remember, we have two of everything, right? Pretty much, right? You have to lose both copies of that gene in the same cell, right? You have to lose not one, but two, right? So it's two events have to happen. If you inherit a bad copy from one of your parents, how many events do you have to have to happen then to lose, to have it gone in a cell? One, right? You only need one event, right? Does everyone get that? In any cell, and you're gonna, that cell is gonna be missing both. Every single cell has a defective copy, right? The likelihood that that happens in this particular case is so high that essentially almost all of the offspring will develop cancer. Right? And they develop eye cancer, but they also develop other cancers. You just don't see it very much. They just don't talk about it as much, right? But they get sarcomas and, and other cancers as well. Okay? So that's how it works, right? So the child is going to get a bad copy. This is loss of a second copy may lead to another one. This is another one called Wilms tumor, a kidney cancer. Right? Wilms tumor, which is a kidney cancer, the suppressor is named after that. Right? So loss in that one leads to uh, kidney cancer. So again, it, this inherited cancer only represents a very small percentage, even with breast cancer, if you do hurt, if you talk about BRCA, we're talking only about 15% or something total right, of all. So that means the other 85% are sporadic or they just happen. Right? So most cancers are not uh, familial, they're, they're not uh, a hereditary in nature. Right? And again, not everyone who inherits the defect will get the disease. It really depends on which gene we're looking at and what cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Okay. Okay. So I don't know how long I have to go because I started late, but I still don't know. I don't want to keep you guys too late. How long should we, we go? I mean, I didn't start till like here somewhere. I, I I would go until you know like tomorrow, but 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 but, but I I'm not have that much more. But I'd like maybe two. Two. Are you guys okay? Yeah, it took me an hour to do the first one though. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> All right. So so I'll I'll go quickly, right? So just to give you some vocabulary, right? Just so you see, the first thing that happens. Uh, when, when cancer develops is the cells tend to proliferate more than they should. There's just too many of them. They look fine, right? If you take them out and look under a microscope and look at them, they look like they should. If they're a breast cell, they look like a breast cell, right? If, if it's a prostate cell, it looks like a prostate cell, right? There's just more of them than there should be. Uh, and uh, then you have uh, a, the next thing would be when these cells, when they're proliferating, they start to push other cells out of the way, right? Out of my way, you're taking my space, right? So they start to shove other cells out of the way, and so that's called met metaplasia. They sort of invade. The, the example of that is Barrett's esophagus. Anyone hear of that, right? Uh, which, well, there you go. So Barrett's esophagus, we'll, we'll make you open up your mouth and all later, but uh, <laughs> I have a light. Yeah. Uh, 
but but with Barrett's esophagus, uh, you have two cell types that meet. Right? That's often where it happens, this metaplasia, when the cervix meets the vagina or the uterus, or when you have two types of cells that are doing different things, right? Right at that junction, it tends to be where that happens. And so at Barrett's mucosa, you have invasion of the, the secretory epithelium into the squamous epithelium, right? So the digestive area hits the area that's just a tube. Right for trafficking, and that's where it happens. And you have a 30-fold increased risk of esophageal cancer. Right, so that that's metaplasia. In dysplastic, right? In dysplasia, dysplastic cells they don't look normal. And so you 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 probably know that when when someone has a tumor removed, they send it to the pathologist, right? And the pathologist will grade it. Right? They say, oh, it's a grade three or grade two. What they're doing is they're looking at those cells and they have essentially an arbitrary scale that hopefully is consistent, right? <laughs> right? In which they say, how much does this cell look like a normal prostate cell? How much does it look like a normal liver cell? Right? How weird does it look? Is the nucleus all big? Because they're genetically unstable, right? They have weird things going on. So how abnormal does it look? Uh, how, uh, if we look at a bunch of these cells, how many of them did we catch? Because we're getting a freeze frame, right? We take it out of the person, we stop everything right there. We can say, what percent of those cells that we can see through the microscope, what percent of them are actually actively dividing? Right? That is called the mitotic index. You may or may not have seen that on a pathology. It says, oh, very active, right? Very actively dividing cells, right? Uh, is this the relative number of the tissues? What, how weird, essentially, how weird does it look? Okay? But in dysplasia, they tend to look abnormal, right? That's abnormal cells. Okay. Now, just again, more definitions for you. A benign growth does not invade neighboring tissues. We already said that a benign growth can kill you, right? You can have a, a brain cancer, it's benign, and it can uh, cause death, right? Brain cancer actually doesn't metastasize very much, right? Uh, it causes death because it's in your brain, right? Can benign growths get big? they can get massive. For some reason, it always happens to some woman in the Ukraine or somewhere, right? It's always Eastern Europe. I don't know why. But they come and they have these 100-pound tumors. You've seen these pictures, right? You see these stories. Someone who has a 100-pound tumor, you can bet that's a benign growth because you don't get a cancer that big that's malignant that isn't everywhere and, and, and going to kill you, right? So they can get big, but they don't invade, right? They don't try to take over other parts. Right? They tend to grow in places where there's a lot of space, like you get ovarian cysts, right? where they can grow and just push other things out of the way, right? or outside the body. Right? But they can get big. A malignant growth is one that invades and moves to distant places. Right? That's cancer. Right? That, that's what cancer is. Now, quickly, I'm gonna, I'll talk about the, the, the major types of cancer. 80% of cancers are carcinomas. These are the cancers that arise from cells that cover things, lining, skin, it's a lining. The, the ducts in your breast, right, they're tubes that deliver milk. Those cells that line those tubes are epithelial cells, that's carcinoma. Prostate, what does prostate do for a living? Does anyone know? Okay, I'm gonna have to just go with you guys. Do you have any idea what your prostate's doing? Yeah, well, it doesn't make sperm, but it helps. It, it makes the fluid that transports them, right? Right. So, so it makes prostatic fluid, right, which is most of semen, right, it, is is coming from the the, uh, the prostate, right? So the prostate is making fluid again, tubes, ducts, delivery system, lining. Okay, those are carcinomas. How about your 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 uh, colon? Is that a tube? Yeah, we're like donuts, right? Just a little circuitous, right? But we're donuts, right? It goes in one end, comes out the other end, tube in between, right? How about lungs? Bunch of sacs? Okay. Okay, good. 
So uh, these are de derived from epithelial cells, the size that line organ doesn't have to be outside. People think of skin, you know, epithelium, they think this. These epithelial cells are all over, right? Okay. Sarcomas are cancers that are derived from muscle, fat, bone, or connective tissue. Right? Sarcomas, much, much less common. Leukemia, leuco means white. Emia means in the blood. White cells in the blood. Leuco. The bald eagle is leuco, something or other. Leuco, eaglis, something. I don't know. I made that up. Okay. But, but something with white, right? Okay. Leukemia, white cells in the blood. Uh, these are derived from white blood cells or their precursors. They look like that. Lymphomas are bone marrow derived, which leukemias are as well. But these are, these are cancers that, that form in the lymphatic system. Lymphoma, right? Lymphatic system. These things are living in the lymphatic system. They act more like solid cancers than leukemia, right? They form masses in the spleen, in the in other places, right? And we now know that they even have angiogenesis, amazingly. Right? Myelomas are specific blood cancers again. Myelomas arise from the cells in our blood that normally make antibodies to defend us, right? And uh, these cells are called B cells. Uh, B cells are named after the chicken organ in which they were found, called the bursa of Fabricius. That's probably what you're going to remember. Right? You're all going to go, oh, yeah, cool fact. Yeah, right? the bursa, right? B cells. Right? And uh, again, cancer is lots and lots of diseases. If you wonder why there's not a cure for cancer, it's because it's not a disease. It is hundreds of diseases. Right? Because you can break different combinations of those 20,000 genes to get to the same endpoint. Right? You have to achieve the same goal. You have to cut the brakes, you have to put the gas pedal down, but you can do that in different ways. And it happens in different ways in different cancers. And that's why it's so hard to have a cure. Right? In 1971, Richard Nixon declared war on cancer. Do we remember that? The National Cancer Act, 1971. And the idea was that 10, year, 10 years, cancer would be gone. Okay? Uh, that's when the National Cancer Institute got special autonomy, budget, all kinds of stuff. They actually gave $100 million to cancer back then in a 100-word proclamation. He must have been like that. Okay. There are inflammation, which I've talked about, which underlies a lot of cancer, and in fact, wounds, right? So to go back to that, right, you get inflammation. Uh, there are other cells, lots of other cells in a tumor. If you look in a tumor, uh, the amount of people tend to think of a tumor as being a blob of cancer cells. Right? Actually, the percent of cells that are cancer cells in a tumor can be 10%, 1%, 0.1, very, very small, right? There's lots of other things going on, right? Uh, which, which we have to study. And it's thought now, and I just put a question mark here, this is pretty technical, is that in a tumor, there are generals and there are soldiers, right? The cancer cells are made up of generals and soldiers. And do we have more generals or soldiers? Right? Or you have a few commanders, right? And a bunch of foot soldiers. And that we have to learn to attack these, these commanders, the so-called cancer stem cells, in order to get at the root of the problem, right? That, that many of our treatments are killing the soldiers, but not the, we're not getting at the command, okay? And that's all I was going to cover for, for now. I do want to refer you to my site, right? So if you want to learn more about any of this, you can go to cancerquest.org. And we have animations, lots of videos and animations and stuff on there. And uh, so please check it out. And uh, I'm sure I'll be back. And